Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very talented character actress. Her name is Marie Cheatham. You all know her as Robert Goulet's wife in the Tim Burton cult classic Beetlejuice. Uh, she's also a soap opera actress. She was in the early cast of Days of Our Lives. And she was also on General Hospital, Search for Tomorrow. Of course, uh, she's also the, the lady on the airplane and the wedding singer who asks uh, Billy Idol, what's the Mile High Club? And she's also been in so many um, classic series that she's a guest star on. Everything from Gunsmoke to Quantum Leap. So many great shows. And it's going to be great to have her today. I can't wait. So yeah, here is my interview with Marie Cheatham. Hey, Marie. Good morning. <laughs> it's afternoon now. <laughs> for you, uh, it's just, I, I've got one more minute for the morning for me. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> where are you? I'm in Redding, California. Oh well, okay, fine. So we're now now we're afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh, I'm wonderful. How are you doing? Oh, pretty good. Uh, it's really windy uh, over here, but um, it's a good day overall. Good. Uh huh. Is it? Does it look like rain? No, thank God, oh. because we had that. Uh, last week, and it, it just drove me crazy. But uh, rain drove you crazy? Yeah, I can't stand rain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can't stand any cold weather. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm too much a farmer to say no to rain. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely. And just so you know, uh, nothing offends me, so swear all you want. I don't swear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I've, I've learned to use creative alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, my mother and I were out... Uh, ranching sheep on horseback when I was four years old in Texas, in the wilds of Texas. And she said, well, sister, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a famous actress and take you around the world. And she was expecting cowboy or farmer or, you know, fireman or something masculine. And uh, she said, what? She said, you've never even seen a movie. And I said, well, take me to see one. So she did. And in that movie, a man got hung. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and I cried all the way home. And my mother said, now, sister, that man lived and he made another movie. And I'll take you to see it just to prove it to you. But you got to quit that crying. <laughs> so I thought, oh, goody, you never die in film. So that's the thing for me. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, I came in that way. So I, I, I have no explanation at all. Yeah. Do you remember what that movie was? No. Like, wow. It was a Western, but I can't remember what it was. It was a Western. <laughs> no. Yeah. So did you start? I've told that story a hundred times. You were the first person to ask me what was the movie. I should, I should dream about it and find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did, oh, I've never I've never really wanted to be anything else. Oh. Uh, that was just sort of the end of that story. Oh. Uh, so did you uh, uh, immediately start doing school plays and community theater? I did. Uh I did everything that uh my parents would allow me to do. Uh <clears throat> I um it was a long time before I got into the theater, theater part of it, but I did, you know, in the school dance, it was high school, mm -hmm. uh, Bel Air High School, Houston, Texas, uh, and uh, Cecil Pickett was the drama coach, and it was very funny because they said, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I talked during
during study hall. So I couldn't have a study hall. And they said, you have to take some other elective. And I said, well, what have you got? Mm-hmm. And they, <laughs> they had home economics yep. and uh, auto shop and, uh, and debate. And I said, well, I already know how to cook so uh, and argue. So I'll take it. Well, and they have theater, uh, dramatics. Yeah. I'll take dramatics, and I, uh, I went into Cecil Pickett's uh, uh, theater program, and I never left. I mean, I, I used to, I, mother and my, my mother and father would say, where are you going? And I said, to the theater. Well, you, you're not in this play. Yes, but I'm, I'm building the sets for it. You know? <laughs> I would do anything to be at the theater working in some capacity, and I didn't care what. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I, I wear my hair in a pixie cut now as I did then because I used to trim it with the razor blade that I trimmed the sets with. And, you know, we used to build a set, so you'd stretch canvas over a frame and paint <laughs> it. And uh, we'd trim the canvas with uh, razor blades, and I would take the same razor blade <laughs> and wipe the glue off it and trim my hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And, uh, uh, you're from Texas? Yeah. Uh, born in Oklahoma, raised in Texas. Wow. So you grew up on a farm, as you said? I did. Early on, yeah, we were uh, ranching sheep, and then uh, mother remarried, and we moved to the city. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So after uh, high school, did you uh, move to New York to study acting? No, I went to uh, Baylor University and took a degree from, I took two degrees from Baylor University um, because it was in Texas and my parents didn't really want me to go out of state. Mm -hmm. So I sort of hung about. I did want to go to New York, but it was always... That was kind of far away and, you know, snaky country, scary. <laughs> <laughs> so I took a degree um, at Baylor. Then I went to work uh, at the Dallas Theater Center. And uh, that was also a master's program, but it was a professional uh, repertory company. Mm-hmm. I joined the rep, rep company and worked on my master's at the same time. And um, then I left there and came to California and uh, worked as a secretary for about a year and then auditioned for things in my lunch hour (laughs) and I got uh, I was cast in Days of Our Lives and the interesting thing about that is they said oh we'd love to have you on the program but you have to do something about that accent and (laughs) oh boy (laughs) and I did (laughs) Yeah, that's what, they, I did. that's what they always tell you to do. <laughs> well, and, and that's very interesting because uh, you used to could, you know, you couldn't have an accent at all. And now uh, most everybody has a regional portion of their speech that they, and I slip into it. Uh, McDonald Carey used to say, because I was cast in Days of Our Lives and I, I played the, the original Marie Horton, and Max used to say to me, I can always tell when you're either angry or tired because your accent comes out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was so lucky to get that role with those people because they were um, Mac and Franny, Franny especially. Frances Reed was my show business mother. Mm-hmm. And she, on the show and off, because she was the, the epitome of how to be on the set, how to, what, what to have as your work ethic, yeah. um, show up with your lines learned, be uh, polite and nice to everybody else, uh, don't have a, you know, a, an attitude that you're better than anybody else. Um, uh, listen to what the director says, and if you have a different idea, you never disagree with the director. If you ha- 
have a different idea, which is a nice way of saying that. You can um, say, excuse me, and then go off to one side and have a conversation with it. Do not stand and argue with him on the floor in front of people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she was wonderful. Uh, she could uh, tell you to go take a flying leap, and she, it would seem as if <laughs> you were being invited to play tennis or something. She, she had a wonderful way of language, and she was a lady at all times, and you could tell when she was angry or tired, too. But she never, ever broke protocol of being of, of being other than a lady. She was always a lady. Mm -hmm. oh, I loved her. <laughs> Couldn't always do it, but I would love her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I grew up in the late 80s watching that version of Days of Our Lives with my mom. You know, people think I'm gay because I used to watch that show. Um, yeah, we'd be doing laundry and watching the show, you know. Yeah. Now, I, well, I have I have a theory that uh, the reason there's so much uh, repetitive stuff in, in soap is because people are ironing, uh, vacuuming, doing the laundry, you know, or having gone to the grocery store and missed that. Yeah. It was before people could tape things or VH it, or whatever it's called. Yeah. And, um, and so you had to repeat it. And the funny thing about that is that when you're doing the script, sometimes, uh, you know, you get into a zone. And sometimes in that zone, you all of a sudden snap and you think, oh, my God, is this what I'm supposed to say today, what I said yesterday or what I'm going to say tomorrow? <laughs> it's a little, um, uh, it's a little difficult to, you know, reading ahead can be dangerous to your health. <laughs> yeah. Do you, don't you think um, that soap operas, though, they can be kind of ridiculous because they come from an old radio medium and it's applied to a TV, you know, they're still talking like they're on the radio. Well, yeah, I, I, I think... That may have changed a bit in the new new thing. I don't know. I don't watch them anymore. So, you know, people say, don't you watch? And I said, no, I don't. My, my mother still does. She eats, sleeps drama. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I found out in my, my, my absolute real life is that I'd rather get paid for it than, you know, it, than endure it in my real life. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get paid lots of money for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I talked to a lot of people who worked on soap operas, and they tell me it's the hardest acting job because uh, you have to memorize 50 pages of dialogue a day. You can't stop. There's no stopping. If you do, you're fired. That's, it's just a, a real stressful acting job. Well, and it used to be worse because we had no I'll fix it in post or, you know, there was no digital stuff fixing it cheaply because yeah. you didn't stop for anything unless the camera bumped into the set and you could see the flats moving. I think they stopped once because of that. But uh, there was no edit, the no fixing it in post. Uh, you did the show, and I was on Search for Tomorrow when they quote-unquote lost <laughs> a day's broadcast, and we had to go live, and uh, that'll separate the sheep from the goats. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good move. It's really interesting, and there was a young boy, I've forgotten his name, who said, I'm the only one that didn't fluff a line, and I looked at him and I said, you're the only one that didn't know what was at stake, dear. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And you know, in the old days, I've heard um, stories about people getting shot and falling to the floor, and then for some reason they crawled out of the scene, and they could be seen on camera doing it, and they didn't even take it over. <laughs> so, oh, that's a bit much. But <laughs> that's so bad. <laughs> Did they write you out of the show? Uh, out of, of Days of, of Our Lives? Quite, I 
didn't quite hear. Oh, did they write you out of the show, Days of Our Lives? Uh, oh, I was written out several times. Um, I went to Africa as a medical... First of all, I was the first victim on the show. You know, a young lady who had everything done to her that they could possibly think of. And then when they ran out of ideas about how to torture poor Marie, uh, she ran off to... Oh, she fell in love with her brother, who had amnesia from the war and did not remember them nor oh yes and plastic surgery and they did he didn't remember them and uh he'd had plastic surgery so that they didn't recognize him got all that mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and uh, uh then marie found out she marie fell in love with him because they were working in the same hospital and she fa they found out who he was because he remembered that the matches were kept in the dining room in a special drawer. Okay? Okay. So, uh, Marie had the, the ultimate nervous breakdown and went off to Africa as a medical missionary. Oh, and get this. She came back into this Protestant family. All of the, uh, the religious scenes had always been Protestant. She came back in as a Catholic nun. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, nobody said, oh, you've become a Catholic nun. No, everybody said, oh, Sister Marie, come in and pray for us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> She came back. I was asked if I wanted to come back to the show. And I said, yes, I would be happy to. Uh, but may I please choose the, uh, the habit? Mm -hmm. And yes, you can. And I chose the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart because I have been in a Catholic uh, boarding school cum orphanage because after World War II there were a lot of uh, kids mm -hmm. who didn't have a father mm -hmm. in Texas where I grew up and my mother was uh, going to school in the daytime working at night and it was different there were no daycare centers so it was difficult to find somebody you know, to help care for me and so to keep me safe she put me in St. Mary's in Galveston which was an orphanage cum boarding school, you know, sort of slash one or the other. And the sisters, the Catholic nuns, uh, were <laughs> the sisters there. That was the order that ran the orphanage. And the deal was, mm -hmm. yes, they would take me, but they got to baptize me and give me First Communion. And, you know, I became Catholic. And mm -hmm. mother, mother thought all religion was great. So she said, sure. <laughs> and I, I became a Catholic. Uh, but the sisters come in two flavors and, and uh, I think anybody, any kid who's been, uh, who's gone to a Catholic school will tell you that this is true. They come in good and uh, not so good, you know, because and like anybody else in a closed community, you have nice people and people who are not so nice. So um, hence all those, those, uh, those, stories about hold out your hands and they whack them with a ruler, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the, that's, uh, and those sisters, and the, the stories and the shows about Sister Ignatius tells the truth. You know, my husband, who was raised a Catholic, I took him to see that comedy show, mm -hmm. and when she goes up and down the uh, aisle, you know, with her uh, little pail saying, all right, spit your gum out here, spit your gum out here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My husband practically crawled under the seat because he remembered what it was like. I was laughing, was laughing to beat the band, but he was really cringing. Yeah. <laughs> so it can, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to Catholic school too. Oh, so you know. Yes. My, yeah, my, yeah. my father, he was the last generation, though, that got to have the, uh, the ruler on the knuckles. He can confirm, oh. he can confirm that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That was not good. Um, but, you know, there, there were wonderful things that happened, too. I developed a, a love of the Latin language. In fact, in high school, I took four years of Latin. Mm -hmm. Omnes Gallia es divise in partes tres. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great, and uh, and it's wonderful because it's you know the root of most of our language, so I can sort of guess what a word means from mm -hmm. remembering 
I left. Yeah. <laughs> so after Days of Our Lives, uh, you started guest starring on many TV shows. Oh, um, no, no, no. After Days of Our Lives, uh, I was in between, you know, doing commercials and auditioning for things. And um, I got a role on Search for Tomorrow. So I went from being the victim to being the high tone bitch. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Um, Stephanie Wyatt was one of my favorite characters to play because she was the lady who did all the wrong re all the wrong things, but for the right reasons. You know, you couldn't hate her because she was really trying to protect her daughter. When I drew very heavily from my background, thank you very much. Um, she was trying to protect her daughter and, and climb up in the world. And so I, I knew all about that. And uh, so this character, just one of my favorite characters to play. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she was very quick, and, quick on her feet and, um, uh, and pulled no punches. And she did everything she could to better her situation and her daughter's situation. So you couldn't really hate her, but she wasn't very nice all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the nice thing about that is that if you're doing roles that are kind of really naughty or mean, mm -hmm. you can get all of that out of your system and then go home and you don't have to kick the cat, you know. Yeah. Really nice. <laughs> And uh, I used to, in New York, I would go to the greengrocer around the corner and get the vegetables I was going to cook for my meal. And the greengrocer, of course, you know, couldn't see the show. And he would say, okay, tell me what's happened, you know. And I would tell him the blah, blah, blah. And I would see these very well healed, because I lived on the Upper East Side, I very well healed, had it and gloved matrons, you know, mm -hmm. leaning forward. <laughs> to hear what I was saying to my greengrocer. And I would then have to say, oh, this isn't real. It's a soap opera. And they would go, oh, you don't watch those <laughs> <things>, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You, um, you, you guest starred on the, the short-lived Don Murray Western, The Outcasts. Oh, well, yeah, that was... Yeah, that was after I came back. See, I I did I did days for a total of about ten years mm -hmm. off, and then I went to New York and met <clears throat> Stephanie Wyatt for ten years, and then I came back out to New York uh, for, to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when I did Bearcats and a few other things, and then I was cast. Oh, I was. Uh, I was cast in General Hospital, and I played a crazy lady, um, uh, Aunt Charlene, who was Lucy Coe's crazy aunt, mm -hmm. who, again, did all the wrong things, but for the right reasons. <laughs> but she was the kind of character that I could use my accent in, and she would say things like, well, you just saw it, why'd you step in it? <laughs> really a very, very interesting character. And that was the beginning of my playing character roles. And I really think that I have waited all of my life to play these character ladies because they're the most interesting. Mm -hmm. They've got the fun things to do. Yeah. I and mean, you got to be in the, the, gold, the golden age of television, you know. I mean, you're also on Gunsmoke and Hawaii Five-0. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, and I think I should have made a reel back then. Of course, we didn't think about reels. Yeah. But I should have made a reel that had all of these instances because I was always in peril. Hold still. Hands up. Mm -hmm. Your husband's dead. You know, uh, all of these things that had great <clears throat> peril uh, associated with the market, you know. Yeah. One word and you're dead. You know, yeah. <laughs> had knives at my throat, guns at my chest. You know, don't say a word and you're dead. You know, <laughs> I should have had a reel with all of that stuff. It would have been very funny. Mm hmm. Yeah. 
And so we get to the 80s. Uh, you were in a very controversial but hilarious comedy called Soul Man. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. When my son uh, goes to the college and pretends that he's black. Mm-hmm. That's, yes, that was. Yes. <laughs> I used to watch this movie over and over again when I was a little kid. and. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, God, it was just so funny. It still is funny to me. And, you know, I think the movie has a very positive message and a great commentary on racism, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Do not be what you are not. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and then, But so many blacks in Hollywood were offended by this movie. And it's not fair, I think. Well, yeah. So many people are offended, you know, that you can be offended by most things. Yeah. Offended by a lot of stuff, but doesn't make it it's just and oh let me tell you we've been watching monty python re-watching it right and um you couldn't do half the stuff that i see uh them do you couldn't do that today because yeah. everybody has has to be so protective of their very slim perch uh you know if you've got two feet on the ground you know some things are funny and it, it's not malicious and it's not boo bad. Mm-hmm. It's funny. But well, you couldn't do half of that stuff nowadays. Well, I don't think uh, people are going to laugh at a pyramid coming down on a guy's head. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I forgot. What was that poem? That was, that was on Money Python. I can't remember the skit, but I remember that happened one time. Oh, 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 and a huge hammer, and, you know, it's. It, a huge hammer is always coming down on someone's head. It, yeah. <laughs> they're, and, and they're funnier now. I think they're funnier now than they were when I saw them uh, back in the 70s. Good God almighty damn. It's wonderful to be this age. I'll tell you something. I would not want to be any younger than I am because That's... I think the world has lost its mind. Frankly. I know, and I'm right in the middle of it. <laughs> and you're in the middle of it, yes, yes, you are. You know, and I'm I'm happy to be my age. <laughs> I, I'm an old soul, you know. I mean, if you saw my movie and my record collection, you'd think we were the same age. I love all the old stuff. Oh, good. Yeah, well, it's good. It's funny. It's good. It's solid. Uh, it isn't flimsy, and uh, it's just good old fashioned fun. Yeah, wow. yeah. Today's stuff is just too fast paced, you know, and they don't give you enough time to, um, you know, give you a warm up of the plot, you know. Well, sometimes there isn't any plot. It's just let's go out and blow up as many things as we can possibly blow up in an hour, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm actually referring. I don't, mind, I don't mind seeing things blowing up, but I'd like to have some kind of a story. Yeah, well, I'm actually talking about television because you know they got so many damn commercials now. <laughs> oh well, yeah. Well, they've always had. We always said that in soap. I used to say we are. Uh, you know, the commercials have already been made, so mm-hmm. there's only so much time you have for the story. So we are. The, that's the uh, the cookie part, uh, and we are the glue. You know, the white stuff in between, like Oreo cookies. Mm-hmm. The, the malleable white stuff in between, because you can shave off some time of the show if it's going a little long. Oh, yeah, they used to make a, um, a finger movement, speed up, uh, a finger movement one way was speed up, and then your, your hand uh, flat and spread out and making a straight line would slow down. Mm-hmm. So we used to get these signals while we were acting, and so we had to take more time to speak or, you know, or deliver our points. <laughs> <laughs> or if the show was short, we had to hurry up and speak, you know, and get all the information out so we could get off the set. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, it's just, it's different now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But on, on Soul Man, though, uh, how was working with C. Thomas Howell? was great. I did a play with him later on in New York, mm-hmm. and I, he had evidently forgotten we had worked together. You know, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, perfectly fine with me. And he, he's a, a very nice man. He was a lovely yeah. gentleman. I enjoyed working with him. And, yeah, he's a, and he's 
these, it, acting is a, uh, is a wonderful profession, but you should never get caught doing it. And uh, he's one of those <laughs> that you, you can't tell he's acting sometimes. So yeah. that's, that's the whole point, you know. Mm-hmm. I've met him at two horror conventions, and yeah, he's a great guy. Um, yeah. I, I told him the first time I met him, you know, I says, I, to me, you're one of the great 80s movie icons, you know, and he was just so oh. modest about it. He was just like, oh. you know, me and all my contemporaries, we didn't know we were going to be uh, remembered all these years later. We were just acting because that's what we were passionate about, and we were lucky enough I, to get into movies. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah who knew? Uh, who knew that my earlier self, who would, I've, I've never thought of myself as an icon. I just wanted to be a working actor. Oh, and that's another thing, too. I never wanted to be a household name. Now, Morgan Fairchild wanted to be a household name. Yeah. <laughs> she did. Yeah. But she wanted. And uh, I never really wanted to do that. I just wanted to work every day. Every, I wanted to be a working actor and respected by my peers. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a, gr- a great philosophy to have, and you succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that other stuff goes away really fast. If you lose your faith, you're gone sometimes, you know. That's interesting. Oh, the nicest thing is that I have been able to work through my ages. Sometimes it, when you're working um, and you begin to age as, an, uh, as a woman mm-hmm. and just get better looking. But women begin to age, and sometimes you don't work as much later on. Uh, but I've been very, very fortunate that I've been able to work uh, and play these, um, like Days of Our Lives. I was the young, uh, the victim, you know, the, uh, a woman who went from teenager into her young 20s and got married and had it with a young mother. And then I was, uh, as I aged and got older, Stephanie Wyatt was a woman in her 30s with a child, single mother, trying to wrestle up, you know, go through life. And then come back to Los Angeles, I was Aunt Charlene, 40s and 50s, who was, you know, still had juice and she was marvelous. And she, <laughs> she, <laughs> she did, uh, she was just crazier than hell. And then... Uh, now I'm playing grandmothers. Um, let's see, Knopf Landing was mm-hmm. the first grandmothers I played, and she wanted the grandchild or the money, and she didn't care which. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really wonderful, you know. And to play these uh, interesting uh, Betty Breland on Heart of Dixie was another one of those really fun characters because she was she was a an upscale lady who said, Well, if you saw it, why did you step in it? You know? Yeah. <laughs> she she um, the lady who owned the town and didn't mind telling you how to run your life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't love it. I've, it's all the things I never get to do in my real life. I never got to tell anybody how to do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've talked to a lot of actresses who have had Botox because they aged. And I oh, just yeah. I just wish I could say to them, why? You're so gorgeous as it is, you know? You're a nice man, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just, they're so, in the I world, just, inject poison into your face. Mm-hmm. And, and also, too, it's just like uh, they live in their own little world, a lot of them, too. And I, I don't know if it's because they're taking medication because the Botox is painful, you know. But it's just, it's, it, they're just, a lot of them are just really strange, I have found, you know. Well, I never really understood if you're an actress, you're supposed to be able to emote and move your face to show surprise, anger. You know, perplexity, uh, curiosity, uh, all these emotions are supposed to be reflected on your face. And if you can't move your face, (laughs) 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 okay, (laughs) fine with me. So how does does Beetlejuice come into your life? Say again? 
How does Beetlejuice come into your life? Oh, God, I bless the day it did. Uh, <laughs> I went over to read for the part, and uh, I, I had read the script, and I said to Timothy uh, Burton, uh, Timmy Burton, I said, how did you ever get anybody to give you the money to do this? And I think that's the reason he cast me, because, I mean, 800 people could have done that role, let's face it. It wasn't a, a role of, you know, any perplexity. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I did ask him, because it was the strangest script I had ever seen. And I really did just blurt out. I probably wouldn't have done that in today's world, uh, but... <laughs> I didn't know any better. So I, how in the world did you get anybody to give me the money to do that? <laughs> so, I, and it was so wonderful because I had worked with Nikki Goulet, uh, Robert Goulet's daughter in New York. And, you know, Robert Goulet had a kind of a, mm, a reputation for being uh, a ladies' man. Mm -hmm. I think the reputation was more... Uh, was more reputation than deserved. But anyway, yeah. uh, he came across the, the set, you know, to shake my hand and say hello, because I was playing his wife, and he was doing the, uh, the polite thing. And he was saying, hello, my name is Robert Goulet. And I said, oh, yes, I know. Nikki says hello, his daughter. And, and he he dropped the, uh, the sort of like the Rue act, and he said, he was just sort of like a kid from Canada then, you know. Oh, yeah. you know, Nikki? Oh, for heaven's sakes. And, nah, 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 nah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then we used to play a game of, he smoked cigars, and I hate them. I hate the smell of them. Yeah. And he would leave <clears throat> her butt where I would find it, and <laughs> I would leave it where he would find it. And then he finally left it on the the uh, handle of my car, which was a Jaguar at the time. Yeah. And he left it there. And I thought, that, that, oh, that man. So I packed it up and sent it to him, to his address in Las, Ve Las Vegas. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so I won. <laughs> yes, but, you know, both of us, we, we took one look at the prosthetics, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the things that they build, and we said, this, we thought it was, um, we didn't know it was a spoof. We thought we were in a turkey film. Yeah. And we, no, he didn't tell us it was a spoof. And, you know, because uh, we were, I think they had done Dune already. Mm -hmm. Knew what things, you know, that were really professional and wonderful looked like. And these Things didn't look like that, and we didn't know what to think. Right. And we all sat around. We, we played traveling games, like I'm going to Paris and I'm taking an A. You know, those games that you play when you travel in a car. Right. And we, we had no idea we were making the icon that it is. So that's great. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Oh, I, have a, I have a Robert Goulet story. Um, I have a, I have a friend, I'm friend, okay, I'm a stand-up comedian, I have, uh, this one friend, uh, who's a, sem she's a semi-known stand-up comedian, and she got to be on one of the very last Jerry Lewis telethons, wow. and she's in her hotel room in Las Vegas, and she hears a knock at the door, and it's Robert Goulet, and he, uh, was just walking by, and he could not, he could not wait he had he asked her if he could go uh, use her bathroom, and she's oh. like, "Of course, of course, you're Robert Goulet. Come in." So he so he comes in, uses the bathroom. Ten minutes later, she absolutely regretted that decision because he left a stinky aftermath. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't ever tell that story to anybody else. <laughs> oh. She told she told it to me on this podcast. <laughs> oh dear! Oh 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 dear! <laughs> well, he's a he was a charming man, and I loved working with him. He was really quite nice. Yeah, and they shot they shot you guys through a high striker. <laughs> through what? The 
high striker, you know, the carnival game? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And that's when you get to explain editing because the young children, you know, love that movie. And they say, oh, does it hurt your head when you went through the roof? <laughs> then you get to explain uh, that they, you, you are, oh, that's another, that's a funny story. Um, you are in a harness and they jerk you up about six feet off the ground. Right. Then they do uh, the shot again, and they put a dummy in it, and that's when you get to explain editing, that, you know, you go up so far, and then they cut the film and put the dummy in there, and it goes so fast that you don't see it. Well, the interesting thing is that I had been flown before, and I asked uh, Bob if, uh, if he had, and he said, no, I haven't. And I said, okay. So I, I brought in some sanitary napkins. Uh, you know, for ladies when they're having uh, their period, because you have to pad yourself because when you are jerked up from uh, ground level up mm -hmm. six feet and it's fast, all of your weight goes into your crotch. And yeah. <laughs> it can be very painful. <laughs> so uh, you have to pad yourself, and I... Sometimes, and, you know, as an actor, you learn to really think ahead and protect yourself because a lot of the times they will, uh, the, the stunt people won't uh, think of these things. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> you know, people who haven't, people who do that for a living uh, know what to expect and know what to do. And sometimes they don't really remember that people who haven't done that before wouldn't know the first damn thing about it. So, uh, so anyway, I, I brought him in a little uh, brown paper bag <laughs> <laughs> with necessaries, and he later on came over to me and he said, "Oh my God, thank you very much." Yeah, <laughs> that could have been really painful. Yeah. I always liked your hair in that movie. Oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So I think I had a lot of it then. <laughs> well, it was, yeah, it was nice and curly, you know, and you looked like you had a lot of chemicals in it. Yes. Well, I, I think it, I was supposed to be pink. She wore a pink dress, and her hair was slightly pink. I think they sprayed it uh, so it would be slightly pink. <laughs> <laughs> yes, big hair. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it, I, don't, I can't remember. I used to wear something in my hair that, you know, uh, that was a piece, and it looked like I had more hair than I had because I have very thin, fine hair, and it packs down. Uh, I'm, I'm very good at traveling because it packs into a small space. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had, a, for the camera, I used to wear these hair pieces that, you know, would fluff up. Mm-hmm. There you are. <laughs> now I wear, you know, I'm 80, but I don't, uh, my mother's heritage was Creek and my father was Choctaw. So I don't uh, look my age at this point. So I wear a gray wig when I go in for auditions for my age. And sometimes I have to play my age. They have to uh, give me old age makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look uh, 80. Oh, that's very clever, I have to say. How was uh, guest starring on Quantum Leap? Oh, he's such a nice man. Oh, what's his name? Scott Bakula. Yes, he's a very nice man. Um, God, I love to work with him. And I had to come on to him and rub my bosoms up against him. Yeah. And, you know, push him down on the desk and pretend I was going to seduce him. Well, um, I'm kind of shy. And so I, <laughs> before we did that scene, I went over to him and I said, no. oh, and that was the first scene we were working together. Uh, they, they chose to do that thing first. They always do that. I hate it. But I went over to him and I said, now, look, I have to rub my bosoms up against you. And I'm a little shy. So would you mind if we shook hands and said hello and um, 
uh, said three or four sentences to each other so that we could sort of pretend we knew each other <laughs> before I have to do this. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, let me give you a hug. Okay, he said, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, my God, you know, before you even say hello, you have to be intimate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Oh, and here's another thing. When you're kissing, mm -hmm. you have to uh, figure out who says the next line because the person who says the next line will have their face toward the camera. So you have to figure out which side of the other person's face mm -hmm. your nose is going to go on. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So you have to choreograph that. And you wouldn't think about, I mean, you, you, all these things that you don't know are going on. <laughs> you have to <laughs> choreograph. Now they, oh, and now if you have a sex scene, you know, an intimate uh, go to bed with each other scene when you're not sleeping. Um, you, they have people now in the union that are intimacy coordinators, I think they call them. Uh, a fancy name for to you know, sort of like work out how you're going to pretend to be making love. Mm hmm isn't that interesting? Who knew? And, you know, used to could. We just sort of worked it out between the actors. Oh, and that's another funny story. Yeah. Because when I started doing Search for Tomorrow, uh, it was in the times that you had to uh, both, uh, see, you couldn't be filmed in the same bed. You had to, a man had to be in one bed and a woman had to be in another one. And then... You could be in the same bed, but you had to have straps on. It had to look like you had your nightgown on. And then it got to where you could go ahead and just be there. This is daytime. Be there, um, you know, seemingly naked. Right. And then it changed, and word came down that uh, I had to put on a nightgown. And I said, why? Because we had been doing it without having to wear a nightgown for a while. And they said, uh, continuity needs to see straps. And I said, well, then put them on him. You know, give him a pair of galluses or something with a pair of suspenders. <laughs> this, this episode had a great... Yeah, you know, if you're not going to be sensible, just get out of my face. <laughs> yeah. This, epi this episode had a great guest star cast, though. Uh, Don Stroud, Casey Sander... Peter Jason, who's been on this podcast, I love him. Oh, Peter Jason is my very favorite TV husband. Really? <laughs> oh, yes. I was married to Peter Jason on a thing called Five Houses, and he played an NRA uh, person. He was the funniest man I have ever, ever, ever yeah. worked with. And I worked with him on Baskets, and he's still funny. Uh, he's just the absolute Best, 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 best. Yes. He's just great. Yeah. I love him. We, we spent... passionate about it. He even bought a, one of my pictures, you know, I'm a potter. Yeah. I'm not working on, uh, in film. And he bought one of my pictures. Oh, I love him for it. <laughs> <laughs> we spent a, a half an hour just laughing and talking it, it was oh. so great, and it's funny. Just before, I mean, just before I'm ending it and stuff, he apologizes to me uh, for for swearing uh, in the story that he told me, right? And I told yeah. him, I told him what I told you at the beginning that you know swearing is allowed on the podcast, right? And oh. Peter says, "Okay, well, next time I'll say poop." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to waste a chance. Yeah. <laughs> And then he's, he's just the nicest man. Yeah. And then I met him a year later at a convention and uh, he was very nice and uh, he had two women with him and uh, yeah, he was a very nice guy. Oh, he's, he's, he's just, Oh, I just love to be, and I love to see him on auditions. Oh, that's another thing, you know, auditions now because of this damn stuff. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, they're all changing. We have to do like self-tape auditions. And even for commercials, you're going to be doing self-tape auditions. And then uh, then the callbacks will be done on Zoom. And they're even sending out kits to your home, like lighting kits to your home. And you shoot it in your very own home. Can you imagine it? Oh, yeah. Everyone's doing the virtual thing during this pandemic. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, well, to me, it just seems, whew. I don't think, yeah, I don't like it myself, but. Um, well, it just seems like we've landed on the moon or something. <laughs> it's like we're all, we're all by satellite. <laughs> exactly. And the interesting thing is that by doing this, now look, you, you have to have the lighting. You have to have uh, a camera, and you have to have somebody to help you shoot it. Thank God my husband's a musician. He knows about wires. So we have the light. Uh, it took a lot of fiddle saddling to learn how to do this. We have the light. We have a circle light, and we have the fill light, and uh, we can shoot it on my iPhone. And then you have to fiddle saddle and, you know, put your the um, uh, labels on it, your name on it, and stuff like that. So you have to know something about iMovie to do that. I mean, you have to, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to be, you have to be the entire crew. Who knew that you were going, I was going to be a lighting director and a, and a director and, and, a, and a gaffer and a, you know, a camera person. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Very interesting. At least you don't have to drive. Yeah. <laughs> you worked with another friend of mine, uh, Katie Barberi, on Acapulco Bay. Oh, yeah, I sure did. Yeah. Yeah. She's well, a... That was very interesting. I mm -hmm. loved being in Mexico. Oh, God, I loved it. This was right before uh, all of that kidnapping stuff and the cartel uh, weirdness started being uh, happening so much, you know, that even ordinary people were affected by it. So this is right before that. And right as I left, a good friend of mine was kidnapped and held for ransom. So that wasn't so good. But see, I'm a potter, and I always have been a potter ever since I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. I used to dig uh, clay out of the uh, riverbanks and make my dollies dishes and, mm. and uh, bake them in the sun, um, you know, to play with. And so I'm still doing the same thing, only now I use a kiln to, <laughs> to uh, fire things. But um, I was so happy to, uh, on my days off, uh, everybody else went to the gym or, you know, went out to the disco. And I was out in the wilds looking for potters so I could you know, uh, observe how they worked and um, and go to the, the museums. I spent most of my my whole life there in uh, the uh, Anthropology Museum and also the Diego Rivera Museum because he's got this uh, pre-conquest collection of pots that is unbelievable. So for me to go and, and you know take my lunch and, and eat there, I, I even went to his um, his studio when you could get into it, and I sat mm -hmm. down on the floor and just ate my lunch right there because just to you know to pretend to be there where these people that I revere so much had, had worked and lived. Oh God. And I love being out in the countryside. And the further south you go, the nicer the people are. Uh, I went down to Costa Rica, and it was, oh, God, I loved it. I lo of course, it's very dangerous now to be there, and it, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Katie, she's one of my biggest supporters of this podcast. Uh, oh, good. She's wonderful, yeah. She came back on a few weeks ago. We had a great time talking. We hadn't talked in over a year, and uh, she just uh, loves what I do, you know, and I'm very lucky to have her as a friend. 
Well, I think you're very enterprising. Any, you're just amazing. To, I mean, it's you make something out of nothing. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God, I I couldn't have put it better myself. You know. <laughs> When I explain things to people and stuff, you know, it's always hard for me to explain, but you just put it succinctly. Well, yes, and, and you know, if you, if you didn't do this, nobody would ever know the things that you uh, talk about with people, and they, they wouldn't know. Very interesting thing. Mm-hmm. Did you uh, listen to some episodes before uh, we talked? I ha- I'm sorry to say I haven't because I was beating a deadline for play. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, I'm going to listen. Well, I, I want I want to warn you. I do two different types of episodes. I do the ones that like we're doing right now. You know, the professional talking about the person's career and all that, right? And then I do episodes. I do them both with celebrities and friends of mine who are not in show business, where we talk about taboo stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I'm very interested in, in taboo stuff, you know, like sex and what have you and, you know, what's oh. going what's going on in the world, you know, stuff like that, you know. Oh. So. Talk, talk about political thing? Not necessarily political. I mean, I mean it, I, I'm not a political guy by any means, but just like commenting on like, you know, this quarantine situation, for example. You know, I've yeah. done a lot of those shows this month, you know intertwined with uh, the with with all the uh, sexual taboo stuff you know oh yeah yeah you know well you know uh it's very um this is dangerous territory for me because if you uh (laughs) you know if people know how you vote sometimes you don't work exactly yes i uh i i i stay away completely stay away from things like that Oh, yes. I, I, there's an actress I'm friends with. Uh, she's been having a lot of trouble getting work because of uh, the way she votes and stuff. And uh, she's no, been... I happen to think that, you know, one way or the other, it's nobody's business. Exactly. Exactly. I, I don't know why they make a federal issue about it. And as, as an actress, uh, I'd be very happy to talk about anything that I have uh, performed or anything like that. But Yep. I don't think that anybody, uh, you know, I don't care uh, about how other actors vote. And I'd rather not know, frankly, because it's none of my business how they feel. Same same here. <laughs> same here. I'm slightly offended uh, that anybody should should want to know yeah. my personal life. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what they're political views are, you know, and, um, you know, when I talk to people about, uh, stuff, you know, that's, that's heavy and stuff, you know, it's not like we, we say, oh, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or yeah. anything like that. So I, yeah, that kind of stuff, I don't want to know, you know, yeah, exactly. I just, and, you know, I was raised, mm-hmm. never talk about politics or money. Exactly. It's impolite. Exactly. And that's how I feel. I was I was raised don't talk I'm about very old. <laughs> yeah, I was raised don't talk about politics, don't talk about money, don't ask a woman how much she weighs, how old she is. Thank you. All that Thank stuff. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, well, well and quite right too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Oh. Oh, I wanted to ask like, you about that hilarious scene you have in the wedding singer. Well, well, you're on the plane. Yes, okay. I'll tell you a funny story about that. Okay. Um, the, in the script, the lady comes in, the stew comes in and says, can you imagine it? This guy just asked me to be in the Mile High Club. And yeah. I kept waiting for the, for the tagline. And mm. there wasn't one. So we did that in rehearsal and we, and nothing happened. And I thought, well, surely there's a button on the scene. I mean, that's not a button on the scene. Yeah. So I looked over at Billy Idol and said, what's the Mile High Club? <laughs> and they kept it in. Now, I had lived that, and they kept it in. Because, to my mind, the scene didn't finish properly when she said, he wants me to be in the Mile High Club. And I thought, and? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh-huh, go 
ahead, right, go on. So uh, I, I ad-lit that and they kept it. You, you were, uh, that was a perfect moment, you know, because it's a British expression and Billy Idol is British and just his smile sells it. It's hilarious. That leer, oh my God. Yeah. Talked about that later on. And that, and that Asian man standing behind him also smiling is hilarious too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a nice movie. That was, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect working with, uh, oh, what's the man's name? Who Adam was? Sandler? Yeah. yeah. And I, I had thought, well, mm, okay, I don't know what to expect about this. But he was, he was um, much more um, appealing yeah. and real and uh, really uh, I cared. Uh, I wanted to care about him. You know, mm-hmm. um, because if you don't care about the characters, why bother? Uh, and some some things are just silly nonsense, and you you know, uh, you just have to work on it to care. But um, but no, I I found him to be charming in his uh, delivery of that character. I thought he was wonderful in that. I thought it was a very nice movie. I think it's one of his best movies, and I don't know if you know this, but it got turned into a Broadway musical. Really? Yeah, I don't think it did well, but it it got turned into one about I want to say ten years ago or something. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Isn't that cute? Yeah, that's great. I'd like to see it someday. Yeah, I'm sure it was great, but I, I remember uh, hearing about that. I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it to me, it's one of the best things he's ever done. Oh, I'm so glad. You know, because I do like to be proud of being in in dude. I like to be proud of what I've done. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't know if I was going to be, and I am. <laughs> <laughs> was Drew Barrymore a sweetheart? Say again. Was Drew Barrymore a sweetheart? She seems like it. She was. She was charming. Yes, she's a very down to earth person. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I do like people who are down to earth and not uh, sold on themselves so much because it gets it's boring if people think that. They're so wonderful that they you can't look at them or talk to them or blah 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 or something yeah. like that. Um, you know, it, it, come on, it's just, it, we're we're entertainers doing a job, and none of, <laughs> really, none of us are going to be put in a time capsule and said that this is the end all and be all of life. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's silly nonsense for people to think. And let me tell you something, fame is fleeting mm-hmm. and it's you've got to have a real solid thrust to your life to, to be you have to be a human being mm-hmm. uh, you have to save else, money it, it looks pretty thin you know you can tell when some people are not all there <laughs> yeah <laughs> even singers and you know entertainers because it's so you can just be sucked into the uh, the um, the the great temptation to think that you're more valuable to humanity than anybody else. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a fallacy. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. It is very weird. How about uh, making a night at the Roxbury? Oh, wasn't that interesting? Now, <laughs> Lonnie Anderson, now I'll tell you a funny story about that. Mm-hmm. In her uh, scene with me uh, at the dinner table, yeah, she looked over and she has this line and she apologized to me before she said it. She said, this is such a mean line. I really have to apologize to you before I say it. And I said, <laughs> oh, just go ahead. And the line is, Oh, you should go and see my uh, my uh, my doctor. He'll be able to take he'll be able to take a needle and just take the fat out of your thighs and inject them into your face where you need it. Yeah. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. And, you know, every time I see her uh, now, and I see her pretty often, 
every time I see her, she remembers that. And she said, oh, I always felt so terrible about doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I lied to you. I I have a persona on this podcast of having no filter, and after and I I haven't offended anybody really, but just because of who I am, that the nice person that I am, after the, the show is over, I always write a an email of I, I'm so sorry I said that to you always. Oh. <laughs> what kind of response do you get? <laughs> They said, oh, it did. It didn't offend me at all because I I know that you're a great person. Yeah. 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 That's great. But but I just I have to do it, you know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so well, I, mean, I should have done my homework and I should have listened to your uh, to your uh, broadcast, but you pr- I have been under a, 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 a deadline. And when you have to make 12 plates and half of them don't work out, you know. <laughs> so, you probably you probably wouldn't have done it if you'd listened first. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've continued working. Um, was there any projects that you were going to do before the pandemic started? Oh, yes, I had been cast. Gosh darn it. I had been, ha- well, you know, you have good years and bad years and of course. Um, or not so good years and I um, I have uh, things have been kind of slow and I had all of a sudden been cast in an NCIS and mm-hmm. the next week they shut down when I was going to go to work and oh rats 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 <laughs> yeah that's a good show though done this a week before yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. But you, uh, yeah, I don't know what to think about all this stuff. Sometimes I think it's a, it's a communist plot. <laughs> yeah, my my mother, oh. my mother and I, we think it was it's, it's a, an attack on the U.S. Quite frankly, you know. No, well, you know, if it, the the fact of the matter is now, I I, I should never talk about things like this. But the <laughs> fact of the matter is that. Um, the North American flu mm-hmm. claims X number of people a year, and we haven't reached that number yet. And I don't know. We know no, nobody shuts down the country for the North American flu. So I would like to know what's going on. Now I don't know what's going on, but. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Seems you know, it doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me either. And I got tested a couple of weeks ago because I was sick for a few days. I mean, dreadfully sick. And th- oh. thank God I didn't have it. Oh, you got tested? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank God I did not have it. Oh. Where did you go to get tested? At my own doctor's. Oh, that's good. Uh-huh. She uh, absolutely loves me, so uh, I was able to get a test from her. Uh, we had to do it outside in my mother's car because um, uh, it, it would have been too much of a hassle to do it inside the office because of, of people's paranoia of getting sick, you know, oh. and everyone wearing masks and all that. Yeah, yeah, gosh. But, yeah, and I recovered. It was like a 72-hour virus or something, so I cut, recovered in three days. Well, that's wonderful, and I'm glad to hear it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you're doing any pottery during this time? Oh, heavens, yes. I have, uh, we just closed the door and locked it. Robert goes to do the grocery shopping. He's very sweet. My husband is very sweet that way. <laughs> and um, I have been throwing pots and making pots, and it's wonderful because I have a, 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 a Marie Cheatham dot com slash ceramics and I've made sales and I just pack it up and Robert goes to the post office and we send it off and it's been wonderful and I've been able to get a lot of things made Mm -hmm. I've been having a little trouble because I got an order for um, plates and I haven't been successful at making plates but now I have a way to do it 
and they're stackable, and they're wonderful plates. But, um, you know, you have to work. Uh, when you're an artist, I think what you really are is a professional problem solver because it seems to me that uh, the things that I do, is, are there, I just solve problems all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think more people Artist should. Artist is, I think. Yeah, I think more. Solver. Yeah, I think more people should do pottery. It's, it's it seems like a very relaxing activity. Yes, it is when it's working. <laughs> <laughs> There's sometimes when it's not working. Oh yes, that's the reason you have to solve problems. <laughs> Why does this have a, a crack in it? You know. <laughs> yeah. So there you are. Yeah. Wow. But I really, I've, I've always uh, enjoyed it ever since I was a little bitty girl. Wow. Make things out of clay and then leave them out in the sun for them to bake, and then I would, those were my dolly dishes. You uh, Do you and your husband ever uh, do what Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore did in Ghost? <laughs> oh, I loved that film, yeah. yeah. But it was great. A classic pottery scene. I think that put That's, pottery on the map. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. So, Marie, there's this game that I like to play with my guests. Uh-huh. It's, um, what it is, is it's silly slumber party questions. And how this works is, I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it. Uh, okay. It's a lot of fun. Don't worry. It's not the, it's nothing inappropriate or nothing like that. Okay. Marie, are you ticklish? Yes. Are you ticklish? <laughs> oh, I am baby ticklish. <laughs> um, what's your favorite part of the body? My hands. What's your favorite part? The belly button. Yeah, that gets very mixed responses. <laughs> yeah. What color are your toenails painted? I would never paint my toenails because they have formaldehyde in the paint and it makes them go white. Wow, you're the second person who's told me that this week. No. Yes. Oh, my God. And that, that's never happened before. That is awesome. No. In fact, I'm trying to find a, 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 a polish. So because I do like to have, you know, in the summertime when you see your, your little toes, yeah. I like to have them colored, but I don't want them to turn white. Of I course not. I to polish that it doesn't have formaldehyde in it. Of course not. Now, do you paint your toenails? I have since I was 13 years old. and No, I, it's something, it's funny. I grew up, you know, I spent a lot of time with my mother and my grandmother uh, growing oh, yeah. up. And I had a lot of female cousins. I've always been like one of the girls, you know. <laughs> what color? Right now they're not painted, but last time they were, they were purple with sparkles because I like to go very elaborate. Oh, you are so funny. Very decorative, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've never done that, that sparkle plenty. You know, I used to paint my nails when I was in New York mm-hmm. and didn't throw pots. But... Uh, you know, I'm always slamming my, and I'm a gardener too, so I'm slamming my hands into dirt or clay, and uh, it just rolls up if you paint them. Yeah. You ever paint them for a roll? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've worn false fingernails too. Uh, Stephanie Wyatt in Search for Tomorrow. Oh, that wonderful lady, long blonde hair. Marsha McKay. Um, when I left Search for Tomorrow, she gave me a um, uh, a present uh, because we used to go to the same nail place. She gave me a present of, of going to the, to the nail salon. Mm-hmm. I thought I've always remembered her kindness because I used to go, <laughs> I used to use uh, the nail salon number 37, and I used to say, I'm going to have to look out for old number 37. You know, that's the yeah. color polish that I use. <laughs> yeah, I did fake, I put on fake press-on toenails 10 years ago, and I, re- I regret it because they my toenails have not been the same since. Oh, you know, you, oh, listen, if you do that, 
stuff. Uh, uh, I, yes, and I have uh, had applications where they mix up a mixture and put it on your nail, and then your nail deteriorates underneath it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's I bad. don't do that anymore, but I did in New York, and I had these lovely long nails. And then you yeah. had to learn how to behave with them. And you had to go, because everything was an elevator, you had to press that elevator uh, button with yes. your knuckle. You had to do a lot of knuckling. And I lived in a building that had doormen, and it was so, you know, it was just uptown New York. It was just so wonderful. Uh, but there was a lady who lived there who used to get the doormen to button up her uh if she had buttons up the back, right? she couldn't do them because of her nails. She'd get him. She'd go downstairs and get him to button her up. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, that's a little much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, weird. Man, I mean, things happen in New York that you wouldn't expect. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. I've heard stories. <laughs> Two more questions. What would you say is your best personality trait? My sense of humor. I agree. You have a great oh. sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, that and I'm not very jealous. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm not either. Oh, but yeah. my, my, I have two really good personality traits. My sense of empathy and the fact that I have no filter. No filter? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yes. That's wonderful. Like I said, that's my persona. <laughs> Gee, that's great. No filter, that's great. Oh, sometimes you have to, though. Oh yeah, I mean, like you know, I've I've been pretty I've been pretty respectful with you since uh, we've been doing this and stuff. But there are, there are times when I'm just I, I don't you know give a sh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I fall into the category of older woman, and you have enough. <laughs> manners to uh, yes. to understand what that is. You know, isn't that funny? I used to have a lot of little old lady friends, and I would constantly send them cards, you know, and right. ask after them, and are you okay? And I sat down, and I thought, you know, I should send a card to, to, to and then I realized, mm, those ladies are dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I... Am now the little old lady. <laughs> so that gave me pause. But although you know, I don't look it and I don't seem like it, and uh, I don't know what it means actually to be my age. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Well, oh yeah, I mean, you you still seem pretty youthful, and you know, it's, it's funny. I've met a lot of eighty-year-olds who don't act like they're eighty. Well, we don't know what it means anymore, and of course, you know, with all the vitamins we've taken over the years, hell, you wouldn't ever, you know, you just wouldn't expect it. <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, we're very youthful. I don't know, 80 used to mean close to death, you know, and, and 60 used to mean, oh, my God, you're old. But it doesn't mean that anymore because we uh, have taken such good care of ourselves. Yeah, because the older generations, they didn't um, take care of themselves as much because they didn't have um, the vitamins and all that stuff, you know? Exactly. And they smoked for 40 years, like my grandmother did. Um, uh, they, they did a lot of uh, abuse to their bodies, you know? Yeah. And somehow, they lived to be like, you know, 90 to 100 years old, whereas a lot <laughs> of the younger generations are dying, you know, in their late 60s now. I know. I know. It's crazy. And it seems to go in certain, uh, I mean, if you make it until blah, blah, you know, you, you're pretty, you're pretty uh, guaranteed a longer lifespan. Um, it seems to go in clumps if you can make it till you're, hmm, people have been dying in their 70s recently. Like, you, you, I read a lot of people, hmm. And then I see, I hear 70s, I go, oh, really? <laughs> and then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Uh, stinky smell that makes you gag. I think vomit. 
that's a popular one. Yeah. Well. Mine. Mine. I'll give you the G-rated version of what mine is. Okay. Chemicals and pheromones. If you can Ooh. imagine what that is. Oh wait. Say again. Chemicals and pheromones. Chemicals and pheromones. People who, who, who hear me play the game all the time that listen to the show, they know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, I kind of did. Chemicals and pheromones. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can imagine. You can imagine. Well, uh, oh, Marie, I wanted to bring this up to you. My birthday is a couple of days after yours. Really? Yeah, it's June 6th. No kidding. Nope. Well, so we're Gemini. Yes. Stone Cold Gemini. Yes, and you know, that's another thing where my, my on-air personality comes in through being a Gemini. Yeah. You know? What's 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 your other personality? Because I I've just seen this you know polite southern lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if crossed, mm-hmm. I can be well. The thing is, if I get threatened, mm-hmm. if I feel threatened, I can be very vociferous. Mm-hmm. That's a, v- a very good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I can drop that Southern Bell ship right away. <laughs> if, I get, if I feel threatened. But if I'm just having a wonderful time, um, you know, oh, I've, the thing about getting upset mm-hmm. is that it works a mischief on you. And I don't like being upset. I don't like feeling upset. In other words, I can't listen to the news and go to bed. Yeah. Because if I get upset, it makes me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. Um, and a lot of a lot of stuff that I hear makes me upset. <laughs> yeah. The stuff that you hear on the news. The news before I go to bed. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to be careful what I read, too, before I go to sleep, because sometimes that, you know, it seeps into my dreams. I have to be careful about that. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, we live in this uh, age now where everybody believes what they read, you know, and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a good thing, too. Not a good thing. No, no. Especially when they read the tabloids. <laughs> yeah. Not a good thing. And it depends on, you know, who you who. What, who you are reading too? I'm careful about. I'm, I'm discerning about. I I like to think for myself, and mm-hmm. I don't want to be told what to think. Same here. I like to think for myself. Same here. After I I had an I had a car accident five years ago. You had a what? A car accident. Oh dear me. Five years ago, and you know I was in a coma for thirty days. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! And I'll tell you, I didn't get any 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 brain damage or anything, but it's uh, it made me a lot more confident, a lot more um, self-respecting to the point where, yeah, I just don't take no crap from no one, you know, and I don't want anyone to tell me what to do or what to believe, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and I wouldn't be doing this podcast now if um, that accident hadn't happened to me, you know, because no I was just I I was just spending too many years just being insecure and drinking and being stupid and and what have you, and that accident just fixed me. No kidding! Isn't that interesting? Because the things you think are the worst things in the world. So much good comes out of it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And people have told me I'm the most articulate that I've ever been in my life because the, it, it like it it knocked it knocked some sense into me and gave me and gave me better brains. <laughs> well, it and told me a difference now. Yeah. Where 
they you might have been sliding before, and now things make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, things well, make a difference. that's so wonderful. My goodness, that's fascinating. Yes. Well, Marie, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. What a, what a delight you are. Oh, thank you. For you. having me. Absolutely. You are the very definition of Southern hospitality. <laughs> I mean that. That's very kind of you, and I do take the compliment. Thank you so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. And I uh, hope after this quarantine ends, um, your, your um, acting roles, you know, uh, come to full wish. And, you know, I don't, the, the industry is going to be weird now after this. So. Oh, yes, but we're, I'm prepared. I know how to Zoom now. I practiced with my, <laughs> uh, my manager, who was so gracious, and said, well, I'll call you at 11 on Thursday, and we'll practice Zooming. So I figured out what it looked like on my, you know, what it looked like on my computer, and I tied it up behind me, and I picked roses and put them in the windowsill, and, you know, so you'd have a place to rest your eyes. Yeah. Um, I, I watched those people on television to see how they conducted themselves uh, doing their work from home. Mm-hmm. And I I did all, so I'm prepared. Now I can self-tape and Zoom, and all they need to do is send me that kit, and we can do a commercial in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. You have yourself a great day, Marie. Do the same. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh-huh. Well, there you have it. Marie Cheatham, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a kind lady. I like her an awful lot. And that was a great conversation we had, not just about her career, but life. I love it. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!